if you don't give it, give something your all, you leave with regret. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 370. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Mr. Jordan Brown. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for Martial Arts Radio. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and you can find everything that we're making at whistlekick.com. Don't forget, if you do choose to make a purchase, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on shirts and hats and sweatshirts and sweatpants and uniforms and sparring gear and other kinds of sparring gear and now other kinds of sparring gear. <laughs> There's a lot going on. You can also find our stuff on Amazon. There's no discount code there, but you might find that more convenient. Maybe you even have an Amazon gift card. So don't forget to find our stuff. Just search Whistlekick and you'll find all kinds of things. Martial artists are great people. I just think that overall, martial artists are the best group of people on the planet. And that's why I'm so honored to be one of them and even more honored and also humbled to get to speak to them and make it part of my job. And that's how I felt when I was talking with Mr. Brown today. We clicked on a bunch of different levels. I, I, I felt I felt like his story was my story. I felt like if we'd grown up in the same area, in the same school, we would have been great friends. And for all I know, maybe we will be one day. But until then, here's my conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Mr. Brown, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. You know, it's, it's really the, one of the best parts of my day, one of the best parts of my job that I get this wonderful excuse to talk about martial arts to other martial artists, knowing that other martial artists are going to listen to it, not because they have to, but because they want to. And that's incredibly surreal in one, one respect, but it's also very, very, I don't know, humbling and, and at the same time feeds my ego a bit. You know, it just, it's, it's the best. So thank you for being part of the group that, that gives me that warm, fuzzy feeling. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> I, I'm just excited to be able to talk about martial arts uh, with anybody, really. So, uh, but the, the opportunity to be able to sit down and, and, and talk about martial arts with you is, is a humbling experience in and of itself as well. Well, you are, you are too kind, and I appreciate that. You know, as much as, as we could talk about me, I don't like talking about me, which is the irony of this show. So I'm going to flip that back around on you and ask you the question that we always ask everybody when we get started here. And that's how did you first find the martial arts? Yeah. So for me, um, you know, I grew up in the late eighties, early nineties. So, you know, the first big thing was GI Joe and then Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So I went around the house chopping and kicking all the furniture. And I think my parents started to get kind of sick of it. And, uh, you know, then then came along Power Rangers, right in the in the mid '90s, and I was I was pretty old to be watching Power Rangers when I was watching Power Rangers, uh, and my friends let me know that too, so that was always fun. Um, so I uh, my parents let me try a karate. Uh, I don't even remember the style. It was it was I, I don't even know. It's it's not I can't find it anywhere. So that's what's funny. It was like it looked like from what I remember like Shorei Ryu or Sho. I don't I don't even know. Um, I don't know if that's a style, but I, I can't find it. The school's gone. Um, it was in Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, I remember going in there and, and uh, dropping down into the splits because I was just naturally flexible. And my brother-in-law told me, hey, he's like, hey, don't, don't, don't do that. I'm like, why not? I'm just stretching like everybody else is. He's like, yeah, just, just don't do that. So I thought that was strange. But uh, we did that karate class and, and I, I loved it. I think I trained there for maybe three months, but it was... Uh, it was like a half hour away from where I lived. And so my parents didn't really want to take me and I, I could only go with when my brother-in-law was going. And uh, probably that was like 1995. And uh, in 19, August of 1996, there was a uh, Taekwondo school that opened literally just down the street from where I lived. Like I could walk there uh, every single day. And uh, we went in and uh, met with the uh, instructor. And, the, and it's funny because the, 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 the dojang, the training floor was really small. Um, you might've been able to get six people point fighting in there at one time, um, in a small area. And, uh, it was, you know, that old 
like green carpet, no mats, uh, wood panel walls, concrete walls, concrete block walls, you know, just a, just a, you know, dungeon looking place. And I loved it. And we signed up and, uh, you know, that's when, that's when I got started and it's kind of been there. Uh, you know, that was what, almost 23 years ago. So. Mm. Now the initial interest, the, the Ninja Turtles, the Power Rangers, I mean, this is not an uncommon story for us here on martial arts radio. We hear about this. I mean, I, I was influenced by Ninja Turtles, by the Karate Kid movie. But quite often when, when people start with martial arts, as you did in this Shoriru school, if it doesn't work out, they don't always go back. And in fact, I don't have any data to back this up, but I would argue that most people don't go back. What was it for you that even though you had to stop, you were still so fired up that when another opportunity came up, you jumped at it? Yeah, for me, like the kicking and punching, right? And and more so the kicking than the punching. Um, just really, uh, really kind of lit a fire in me from an early age. Like I said, from when I was kicking and punching the furniture, uh, probably when I was like five or six. And I remember, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be nice and not tell you that, well, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll be mean. Um, so the credit kid came out before I was born, um, just barely, uh, by like six months, I think, or eight months or something like that. And uh, so I didn't see that until I was, uh, I want to say five or six. And uh, watching all the martial arts action and that was, was uh, you know, awesome and amazing. But then to watch, um, and, you know, same thing with, with uh, the Ninja Turtles, but then to watch the Power Rangers, I think that's re what really just kind of lit it up for me. And seeing them do something that was very different, right? Because Ralph Macchio was not a martial artist, but some of the kids that were in the original Power Rangers series, they were martial artists. And to see a good sidekick thrown in a TV show, it was like, I want to do that. And it wasn't necessarily all of the the flipping and the, the acrobatics of the martial arts that I really enjoyed. It, it was just the down straight up technique that I really, really enjoyed watching and, and to get a taste of that and then to kind of have it taken away a little bit, kind of made that burn a little bit brighter. So when that next opportunity came along, I was like, Hey, let's, let's do this. Mm. Nice. Nice. And then that, that makes sense. You know, it, it, if you were continuing to watch, if you were continuing to be influenced by martial arts and pop culture, absolutely it makes all kinds of sense. And it's great that you had that opportunity to find another school, something so close. Now you said it was literally just down the street and you could go there every day. Were you there training daily? So I was there every day that they were open from the time they opened until basically I was the last one to leave. My instructors would get so upset because I would <laughs> wait so long to call my parents to come pick me up uh, because I wouldn't, at first, they wouldn't let me. I, was, I think it was uh, 10 or 11 when I started. So they wouldn't let me walk home at, at night, but they would let me walk there. So, uh, and it was only, like I said, only a few, few blocks away. Um, so I would walk there and then, you know, classes would start at, at 6, I think. I would get there at 5.30 and, and sit on, uh, right in front of the door. And uh, they would be sitting there waiting in a chair uh, until my parents picked me up and then they would shut the lights off and lock up and leave themselves. So, and that was probably nine fifteen, nine thirty, And I think we did, uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays were the days that we trained. And I was there every single one of those days. Wow. Now there is a certain personality type that, you know, wants to be incredibly early to things and, and stay super late to things, but Something in my gut tells me that that's not how you are for everything, that it was something unique to martial arts. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I'm not uh, early to most things unless I, I can't. Like, if I can be, I'll try to be early, but it's not uh, an, uh, kind of something that's built into me. But when it involves martial arts, you better believe I'm there early. I'm stretching out before the lights are on sometimes in the facility that we're using or whatever else uh, comes along. But uh, with, with, with martial arts, it's always just been different. It's always, it's never been a struggle for me to go to class. It's never been a struggle for me to go train. It's never like, 
I, I go. I want to be there. Um, and I, I don't want to leave. So, Do you have any insight as to why? Uh, you know, I, I, I wish I did. It's, it's funny. It's just, it's always been like one of my biggest passions. And, uh, you know, I remember being like, uh, I, you know, the first, the first, I still remember my first class walking in and there was a, uh, a gentleman, um, I think his first name was Ryan. He was a blue belt and, uh, my instructor or who, my, who would, who would become my instructor. He was a school owner said to me, Hey, this, this is Ryan. And, you know, he's going to be the next world champion uh, that we that we have. He's he's really good, and I remember thinking, I want to be that. Whenever I I get, I get into the ranks, I want to I want to be the next world champion, and uh, you know, it's just every little thing, getting my orange belt, getting my sparring gear, getting a yellow belt, uh, going to my first competition. Everything is always just like I remember all of that stuff. I can still sit here. I'm, I'm a fifth degree black belt now. I'm going to test for sixth degree next year. And I can still remember the white belt form that I learned uh, 23 years ago. So, I mean, it's, that stuff has stuck with me. I can remember all of the color belt material, the black belt material. I can remember all of it. I, I, I don't, it's not like I have an amazing memory. I can just remember that stuff. And I have no idea why. Um, other than the fact that it's just something that is completely ingrained in me. Mm. I'm going to guess it's because it matters to you that some, Absolutely. something about martial arts either filled a void or, or how old were, were you when you started? I was uh 10 when I started those karate classes. And then I was 11 when I started uh, doing Taekwondo. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to play the odds based on what I've heard from a number of guests over the years, maybe in martial arts, you found a version of yourself that you wanted to be that you weren't or struggled to be outside. Yeah. yeah I would say that that's pretty accurate. I, I, you know, it's funny because I remember being, um, and, and my parents were telling me this too, that I was a, a pretty shy kid, uh, before doing martial arts. And then, you know, the confidence that you get from doing martial arts. And, you know, I remember breaking a board as a white belt, and thinking like, oh, this is amazing. And I, I still have that board too. It's over on my shelf right now. Oh, cool. And uh, the confidence that, that that developed in me from that point. It's so powerful, the, the stories that we hear on the show. And it, it's so amazing to me to see that my story is so similar to your story, is so similar to so many stories. And there's really only two ways that we can, I think we can look at that. We can say that the people who find and stay in martial arts, you know, needed martial arts more than they needed other things. And, and thankfully we found it. Or, and I, I think this is probably more likely, we all need martial arts. We can all benefit from finding that place that helps us feel confident. You know, we all struggle with self-esteem from time to time. I mean, you, you have a school now. Is this something that you're witnessing and the students coming in your doors you know it's absolutely and it's the funny part because not only do we have little four-year-olds who come in who, who need to be doing it but you know i've got a guy who's who started doing martial arts at 55 and the the growth that i've seen in the four-year-olds and the growth that i've seen in the 55 year olds is amazing when you step back and look back the 55 year old's been with us for uh over a year now and and I don't even mean in his physical abilities, but just the way that he talks about what he's doing and how he's doing things, the confidence that has in, improved in, in him. And he, he told me recently, we just had testing this past weekend. And he, he told me uh, Saturday when he came in, he said, you know, you told me that you used to stand and watch you know, martial arts videos and you would work on your balance. And he's like, I couldn't understand what kind of person has the time to just sit and watch martial arts videos. He's like, and then next thing I know, it's, it's three o'clock in the morning last night and I, I'm, I'm up watching martial arts videos and I do that for three hours. <laughs> and it's like, now you see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, if we were to describe what we do, you know, to someone who doesn't know what martial arts is, it's utterly ridiculous, right? I mean, there are so many elements of what we do that are silly. The people that we tend to build the strongest bonds with are often the ones that will 
challenge us the most or maybe even hit us the hardest. Mm -hmm. We form friendships that kind of defy what friendship means outside of training. But yet there's yeah, I mean, something so fundamental about it, isn't there? Yeah. And and that's the yeah, I saw something posted on social media recently where it was like, you know, that it, it's only a martial artist that would get kicked in the face by somebody and then be best friends with them right after that. Like, you know, there's something that that is I think innate. That was hours. Yeah, you know, I say I saw it posted a couple of times. It was like everywhere. <laughs> I think that might have been hours. Yeah, I would say I I think I, you guys posted. I think I saw um, uh, Master Chip Townsend post it. Yeah, um, which it could have been from you guys too. But you know, it, it, it but it's so true though, right? Like, it is you, you know, I could I, I still remember going to all those competitions and and literally wanting to tear that guy's head off that's across from me, you know, on the other side of that line. But then we get done and being like, hey, man, what are you doing later? Like, let's go hang out. Like, right. It's just it's just what you want to do. The the only other sport I've ever seen that in is rugby. And I, I never played mm -hmm. rugby, but I had friends that did and and would tag along to some of the events. And these guys would beat the tar out of each other. And then all, they'd all go to the pub and go drinking. Yeah. Yep. And we don't <laughs> always wrap it up with drinking, but I see it at competition all the time. The person who won first and the person who won second are off on the side after they're done competing, sharing, helping each other get better, knowing that it's going to make it that much harder for them to win next time. Yeah. And that's, that's the part that always amazed me. Like, and, and even now I still, I still compete and I'm going to be getting back into that quite a bit this year. Um, as long as my, as long as my foot stays healthy, but, uh, you know, I have a, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, where I, I do a, a lot of um, martial arts sparring tips. And um, the last tournament I went to, I had a guy who goes, have I seen you on YouTube? And I was like, oh, crud. Yeah, <laughs> you probably did. And I thought, uh-oh, he knows all my secrets. But, you know, at, at that point, I don't, it's, I don't care, right? Like, it's just, it's, I, I enjoy helping other people to see them grow. And uh, even in competition, it's still fun. So. Sure is. So I think we've got a pretty good idea of who you are and where martial arts fits into your life. And when you think about that life as a martial artist, that time that you've put in training and, and instructing and competing, you have stories. We all have stories. And I love to hear other people's stories. So what is your favorite story from your time training? There's a, there's a couple. Um, the first one is, is really a, a fun story in that I didn't realize that it was going to be a martial arts story. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, actually it was about a decade ago. Now, uh, my wife and I were dating at the time and she introduced me to this really tall guy. And, um, he, he coached, uh, basketball. He was older. He was like her parents age and he co coached basketball uh, for a homeschooling group and his son, uh, knew that his son and my wife were um, were friends, and I just kept looking at him, and I'm like, he looks really familiar, and um, I, I couldn't I couldn't place it. And uh, my wife asked her mom about it, and we randomly ran into them in like a Walmart or somewhere. And then he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he goes, "Didn't you teach me martial arts?" And then the light bulb clicked and I realized that I had taught their entire family when I was like 13 about sparring. And here I realized I was this kid teaching this grown man who was probably late 30s, early 40s at the time. And uh, the fact that there can be these connections that still like I, I knew I could place them, but I couldn't figure out where it was. But there's these connections that occur um, uh, where whether you were. Uh, you know, whether you were doing martial arts, teaching martial arts, competing in martial arts, that act of the kicking and the punching and then the stuff that goes along with it can kind of transcend a lot of different things. And then you don't realize impacts that you make until years later. Mm. So true. So true. Was that weird for you in that moment, realizing that someone from long ago, from a pretty different time in your life. I mean, from 13 to an adult isn't always a ton of years, but certainly you look different, you act different. Was, was that, um, I don't know, what was that experience like? 
Yeah, it was it was funny because it, it really made me realize that I was when I when I was doing a lot of teaching at 13 and 14 and, you know, yeah, 13, 14, you know, everything. Right. <laughs> um, I, I realized how much of a kid I was because at 23, I actually felt like a like, like a kid then, too. And uh, it it was it was like how much you can gain from people that you you don't expect to gain stuff from even though it was myself like i realized like okay well who else can be teaching me something that knows a lot about something that i i'm taking for granted um so in in that sense it was it was very different and um kind of helped me realize that not not everything is is exactly as we think it is and there's still a lot that we can learn from this this most strangest of places if we just are open to it, right? Like mm. our cups are empty. We can, we can fill it up with stuff. Um, and it can come from, uh, you know, big pots, little pots, doesn't matter what it comes from. That's right. Now you mentioned you had more than one story. Yeah. And, uh, the, the other one, uh, is, is a story that was more, more recent. And it's just the fact that I, uh, you know, I, I started my martial arts school in 2012 and then had the opportunity. Uh, I think it was like, right about two years ago, about this time, two years ago, maybe, maybe a little less. Uh, I went back to my hometown. Uh, I live about uh, an hour away from my hometown where I grew up. And um, I was in town to see my parents and I drove by my old school, my old martial arts school and the lights were on and there was a car out front. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to stop and, and see if anybody's in here. So I go in and there's a, a, a woman who, um, I haven't seen in a long time, but I was, I, I taught her like white and orange and yellow belt. And then uh, I think she got black belt and I went and uh, went to her, her black belt testing um, and went to a, uh, one of the world competitions with her. Uh, and she was there and I actually had my, my daughter, she was a real tiny baby, but it was weird going, coming from owning my own school, owning my own facility for the last five years and then walking into my old school and realizing again how small it was, but then kind of all the memories that were there too and how different it was now as well. You know, like the, the, that green carpet is now blue carpet. It's still not matted, but it's got carpet in there. Um, and just, just things like that. And, you know, to look at where I am now and look from where I came allowed me to kind of sit back and, and think about, my journey, right? My journey from white belt. I literally started as a white belt in that school to where I am now. Lots have happened, right? We talk about you know, a lot of times blood, sweat, and tears that go onto the mat. Well, there's lots of blood, sweat, and tears uh, in that facility. And, you know, been lots of blood, sweat, and tears in my own facility um, just in, in the last uh, almost seven years here. And it just puts a lot of stuff into perspective for you too. Mm. Absolutely. You know, just this past weekend, I was at an event and we did some video. And the question that I was asking everyone was, what would you tell yourself if you could find a time machine and go back to your first day of training? Oh, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, I think for me, um, I uh, did a lot of, top 10 competition um, in my late teens, early 20s. Um, it wasn't really until I, I hit like, like 21, 22 that I, I, I was really good at sparring. Um, and at that time, I was only training a day a week. And, uh, you know, I, I took it somewhat seriously. I didn't travel as much as I should have for it. And, um, when, when uh, the end of the year came around and, you know, the top 10 go to, uh, would go to comp compete for world champion, I would always end up slightly out of it where I would be like uh, 11th place mm -hmm. or 12th place uh, just outside of points. And it would be because I wouldn't go to one of the national tournaments. Um, but part of me just, I just wish I could go back and, train harder, like do more, like really put an effort into it. Because I feel like now being 33, 
and being on the side where, um, you know, I, tra- I train a lot more now than I did at 23. But realizing that my body takes a little bit longer to heal than it did before, and that things are uh, a lot, uh, are just are starting to slow down for me. Um, I wish I would have just done more then, and uh, you know, really went for it. Mm-hmm. You know, spent 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 a little bit of extra cash because here's the thing: like I, I was always very money um, intolerant. You know, I, I didn't want to spend a lot of money. Um, but now I kind of wish that I, I would have, because then I would have had those experiences, right? Like, you know, for me, I've, I've realized over the years that, uh, experiences are greater than things. And that would have been an experience for me that I could have looked back on and said, yeah, I'm glad I did that. So every now and then I feel like, you, you know, if you don't give it, give something your all, you leave with regret. And so that's kind of the mentality now that I have is just give it whatever it is that I'm doing now give it my all so that way there is no room for regret. One of the things I find that I'm telling myself lately, if I'm not sure how to make a decision, you know, for example, do I spend the money and go to this competition or do I, do I save the money possibly for something else? I try to fast forward, you know, if I'm God willing, you know, a hundred years old and on my deathbed and I'm reflecting on my life, which will I have had more value in? You know, and that's been a pretty good yardstick for me, you know, especially as someone who's an introvert. You know, I, I prefer to be inside. I mean, let, let's face it, this is an audio show, not a video show for a reason. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but that's, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, that's that's the thing for me. Like, I sit back sometimes and think, like, you know, it is, you know is this what I want to do like the rest of my life? Do I want to teach martial arts? Um, you know, I could, there's plenty of stuff I can do um, that would make, would make me a whole lot more money. Um, but it wouldn't leave the impact. And, you know, I, I left, I left the advertising industry uh, when I started my school and went and started working at my school full time. I, I kind of left it and I keep coming back to that decision that I made. And it was because how much value am I bringing? And I'm, I'm going to use broad, like how much value am I bringing the world? What kind of impact am I making by making, um, by helping other businesses sell 10 more widgets, right? Um, by advertising their products, uh, as opposed to truly impacting one more life, right? Every, uh, every student that walks in this door, every, every new person that comes in to try a class on our mount is, is one more person who we could ultimately impact. and what what we do on that map for that person could literally impact the rest of the world i mean who who knows what their potential is and that's the that's the powerful one for me as being a martial arts instructor now is is what am i doing now that's impacting the next generation of people to do amazing things and and that's really um why I step on the mat more often now than, than the, the training aspect, because let's, let's be honest, the training hurts more now, <laughs> um, you know, 10 years ago, it was a lot easier. Now it's not as easy, um, hurts more and you feel it for a couple of days longer, but, uh, you know, it, you see a new student who's struggling on the mat and it's like, let's go, let's, let's get their confidence up. Let's get them going in the right direction. Yeah. You know, that, that, discussion around what is a successful martial arts school because that's kind of the question that you pose has so many different ways to look at it and i know so many different instructors who love their school and love where it is they love their definition of success and that's what they've achieved and there are different ways to achieve that there was i just saw a post in a martial arts school owners group the other day where someone was asking for a coach to help them get get better, to help them advance their school. And I said, well, first you have to define what success is for you because different people will coach in different ways. And it, 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 it kind of veered off into this conversation about what is success to someone? You know, is success the number of students? Is it the impact they've had on a core group of students? Is it money? 
Is it their ability to teach all day and not have a separate job? And, and they're all valid. Yeah. And I think it's important to find which one works for you. So what's, when you look at your school and your role as an instructor, how do you define success? Yeah, for, for us, it's super easy. It's, it's about the impact we make, right? Like, you know, there's, there's all these, all these people who, who talk about, you know, well, I have, you know, seven students, but these seven students are just amazing, uh, outstanding martial artists. They can do a hundred pushups and they can do 5,000 squats. And you're like, that's great. That's awesome. But are, what are they, what else are, can they do? Right? Like, there's definitely the physical a- uh, applications to things. And we try to be pretty, uh, pretty in tune to technique and to things like that. But it's, it's more so the, the confidence, the, the leadership, the self-control, the discipline, the focus, the, the, the life skills that they can get out of martial arts. That's where we feel like we win the most. Um, uh, and, and that's where we want to see all of our students achieve great heights in is being able to walk out of here. And if you walk out of here with a black belt, awesome. You definitely earned that black belt, but you, you walk out confident, you walk out with discipline, you walk out with focus, you walk out with self-control, you can take on the world and everything that it has uh, in it. And, you know, you can fall back on what you've learned in martial arts through the years. Right. Let's say they get their black belt and they quit, which we try to avoid have happen, have happen. But we want to see them, if they do that, be able to see them fall back on their training. Let's say they quit at 10 or 11, but they, you know, they're able to fall back on it when they're 22 because they remember the discipline that it took to, to get that black belt. That's what we want to see. That's our win. And I think that that is how so many others would define it. You know, opening a martial arts school is a great way to work really hard and make a little bit of money. Exactly. And it's not to say that there aren't financially successful schools out there. And it doesn't mean that a non-financially successful school can't become financially successful. You know, there, there, there are plenty of great people out there to help you do that. We've had some of them on the show. Yeah. And, and you know, for, for us, we, you know, for me, I have a little bit of a, um, a, a different take on, on success too. I mean, for, for the school, I, I want to create a spot that where we can, where we can create jobs for, for people too, where, you know, these 16, 17, 18 year old kids can learn about, about hard work and about getting paid and uh, what it's like to have a job, but something that, that you, you love to do, you can actually make money at. Um, you know, for example, we have, um, two women who work front counter and, and kind of back office stuff. And then we have four employees who um, are between the ages of 14 and 19. And they're learning how to have a job, how to maintain that job, but then also how to, you know, make cash and then teach amazing martial arts classes and things like that. And that that's kind of my goal is to be able to bring up this, this you know, these teens to learn how to really function in the society that we have today. Mm. You know, when you were talking about some of these, these non-martial arts, but life skills, it, it, it kind of connected a couple dots for me that I've, I've never noticed before. So I want to, I want to thank you for this and forgive me as I, I kind of stumble through it. Mm. Martial arts instructors tend to be really good at teaching hard martial arts skills and even personal development skills. But, I watch so many martial arts instructors when they're dealing with people outside of those skills. You know, the, the, the family who just isn't good about paying on time, for example. And they get so upset about it. Or, or the family who is often late and they punish the, the student without, without digging in, Mm. you know, and I see the opportunity as an instructor to be, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't start when class starts and end when class ends. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure you've had, I mean, I, I just rattled off two specifics that, that first came to mind. I'm sure you've dealt with both of those and dozens, if not hundreds of others. How do you tackle that? 
Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest things that I had my staff do, my especially my instructor staff, is reading um, "Be Our Guest" by the Disney Institute, mm. and um, you know, it talks uh, about sprinkling the pixie dust, right? And um, it's all about customer service, and you know, with with martial arts being as as personal as it is, um, sprinkling the pixie dust goes a long way in a lot of different ways, and you know, I, I remember seeing somewhere. A few years back about, you know, it was like, uh, you know, martial arts instructor, what people think you do. And it's not like one of those ones that were like six things. It was just like teach martial arts. And then below it, it gave like two long lists of what you actually do. And like one of them was like therapist and a uh, fitness coach and just a big laundry list of things that you do. And, and you realize that like you sit back and you hear all of these people's stories. I'll sit in the parent seating area and listen to some of the parents and the parents will tell me about the, the, the drama that they've had in their life, the deaths that they've had in their family, the bullying issues that their students have had, um, the challenges that they have at work and why they can't get here on time. Sometimes the, the challenges that they have like medically and why they can't pay the way that they want to. And they just spill out all of this information and you sit there and you, you kind of nod along thinking, I am not qualified to handle this conversation. <laughs> but, you know, you, you help them the best way that you can. And it's amazing what you can do for somebody by just sitting and listening. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we, we try to help our, our staff to understand is, you know, yeah, you, they may have misspoken in this instance, or they may have, um, you know, been a little disrespectful to you, don't give them 20 push-ups right away. Figure out if they've had a bad day. Figure out what's going on in their life before you just jump to what, they're, what, what, what you think the problem is. Because if, if this student who's normally on it is suddenly disrespectful, something's probably up. And we need to figure out what it is that, that has happened in that case. One of my yardsticks that I... I fail at constantly, but I, I still keep trying, is to assume the best of people. If someone screws up, assume it's for the best possible reason and then find out why. Rather than that, that gut reaction of, you know, they just don't value my time or, or you know, they don't, they don't care about the project or, you know, they're just wasting my money, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, I had, I had an incident um, involving someone who, who um, was kind of taking advantage of me a little bit. And, um, and, and, that, and the big thing there is, is even after realizing that, for me, I, I just want to be helpful wherever I can. And, um, you know, it's in, in this instance, it was one of those cases where, well, I see, I see your character. I'm, I'm now going to show you mine. Um, by continuing to do what I've been doing all along and helping you through whatever it is that you, that I can do. Um, I, and, and it was one of those cases where they knew that uh, I knew that they were taking advantage of me. Um, but, and, and what I'm not, I'm not trying to sound holier than now, but what I'm trying to say is that if I can help them realize that like good people can do good things and, and you don't always have to be good, but you can learn from other people's examples, then maybe that's, the best place to start. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It does. And I, I think, you know, this is a conversation I'm finding I'm having more and more with people because of social media, because of the, yeah. it, it's so trivial to tear someone apart, to assume the worst of people. And no good ever comes from that. And that's what I find ironic is all of these people who you know, I, I see it mostly on Facebook who will post something that if you, if you really dig into their intention, it's because they want to improve things. They want things to get better based on whatever their criteria, their experiences are. And in, in manifesting that into some, some words or, or pictures, they end up attacking a significant group of people. And, and you can do this on any issue. And the mm -hmm. thing is, how does that help? I mean, we talk about this in, in martial arts. If you're trying to de-escalate, 
<laughs> you you don't get in someone's face and tell them that they're they're stupid or ugly or they can't beat you in a fight. Right. Exactly. That's like I I remember uh, uh, Master Chip Town. So I keep, I've said him a couple times because he always posts stuff that I I notice. He posted one of two dogs uh, barking at each other on the other side of a door. And uh, they opened the door and the dogs both stopped barking at each other. And it said something along the lines of, you know, real life versus Facebook. Right. And, and yes. uh, it was like, yep, that, that 100% makes absolute sense. It does. And yeah, Master Townsend's been on the show. It was a great episode. He's a, he's a mm-hmm. wonderful guy. And uh, this is a great opportunity to let people know if you're new to the show, you can find the show notes and, and we're going to link to that episode and, and the Disney book that you mentioned and anything else that comes up in our conversation at Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Dot com so people can find that over there I, uh how do you know master townsend yeah so um i actually know him through um another individual's name is michael mershad he he is the president owner of the ultimate leadership martial arts association alma for short he is the association that um uh, we are affiliated with oh, okay and um he brought him out to uh, one of their events oh man like five or six years ago and, um, you know, it's, it's funny, Master Townsend was actually one of my kind of childhood heroes in the, in the late nineties. Yeah. Um, there was a, a discovery documentary, um, like an XMA, it had, uh, 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 Mike chat and, uh, Matt Mullins in it. And, uh, there was a breaking section in there and, and Master Chip was actually featured in there talking and. Uh, you know, hit a lot of stuff and he had the eye patch on and everything. And I was like, that guy is awesome. <laughs> and so I'd been watching his stuff for years uh, through high school and then college. And then I opened my own school and, uh, you know, uh, I was talking to uh, Master Mershad one day and he's like, yeah, Chip Townsend's going to be coming in. And I, I think I lost my mind for a second. And uh, so I, I, I got to meet him at the event and, uh, chatted with him he he has um his uh break like a champ website and series uh, which is uh, an amazing resource and i actually was uh lucky enough to work with him on that oh cool. and uh yeah i built that website out for him and oh nice yeah I, I checked that out before we did the interview yeah so i it, it was it, it's funny i i remember after having done that um i actually saw that chip was on the the podcast and i think that's kind of how i first heard of whistle kick oh cool and so then i Drove out to I drove out to Colorado uh, two years ago, and so I just loaded a bunch of uh, podcasts uh, up and listened to that because it was a 16-hour drive from uh, Indianapolis oh. to Denver. It's a long drive, and uh, yeah, so I, I got a got a lot of whistle kick in. Uh, and, and you still wanted to talk to me after hearing my voice for that long? Abs- absolutely, I was like, <laughs> hey man, I could talk to this guy forever. It was it was perfect, but yeah, so so. Uh, and it was great because I actually uh, had the opportunity. I wanted to go out and, and work with him one on one. So I went out to Abilene, Texas um, that same year, two years ago, and um, got to stay with Chip. He was gracious enough to let me crash at his place. And wow. we, we, we trained uh, every morning. That guy gets up every morning um, and trains at 5 30 in the morning. Yeah. And uh, that, <laughs> I get out there the first day, I think it was on Monday. I trained at 5.30 in the morning. I trained at 11 a.m. And then I trained at 7 p.m. And, uh, and I, I don't, I'm assuming most people, if you haven't seen uh, Master Townsend's breaks, the intensity that he brings to that, he brings to his training as well. I believe that. And, and uh, I, I don't, I, I train pretty intensely, but not, not that much. And um, that night there was a, a horrible storm in Abilene. And uh, he's like, yeah, I, I, I thought about coming up and getting you. And, he, and he's like, Did, he's like, were you scared at all? And I said, Master Chip, I didn't hear anything. I was out the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> I slept so well that night. Uh, yeah, I had no idea there was a storm at all. So, um, yeah, it was that was a that was a crazy week, and and uh, love the opportunity to go back out and do that again. That was that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of training, but it was a lot of fun. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. And I'm guessing that during that 7 p.m. training session, at some point, you're looking at the clock and thinking, I have to do this again in like eight, nine hours. Oh, I was pumped. I was ready, man. Really? And oh. remember how I was talking about how first in the gym, last one to leave? Yeah, I was, yeah, I was okay. like, I'll go to bed. I'll get up. At five. I'll get up. At, I think we were getting up at 445. Oof. 
uh, to, to get there on time. And, and I was, I, the only thing I, I just knew I was going to be really sore the next day. And so that was my only hesitation. And uh, I think the, when, the Wednesday one, I skipped one day, one or, early morning because I, I literally couldn't walk. <laughs> I had to like, it, 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 I slept in and had to wait until my legs would function a little bit. But uh, yeah, no, I was pumped the whole time to, to be training. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I mean, very few martial artists know what it's like to train twice in a day. And the number who would train three times in a day, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's got to be under 5%. You know, the only time I've trained yeah. that much in a day is at some kind of camp. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. That's, that's probably the, the first and the only time that I've trained three times in one day. Oh, I, I won't say that because I do a lot of rock climbing outside of martial arts. And so I'll do a martial arts class where I, anytime I teach an adult class, I do the class with my adults. And so I'll do a, a morning adult class and then I'll go climb or lift or both. And then after that, come back and teach another uh, evening class. Um, so there's, there's days where I do actually do three, three different workouts and, you know, anytime I'm like training with weights or tr doing rock climbing, I'm also throwing martial arts techniques in there too. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned that when you're teaching the adult class, you're in the mix doing it with them. When mm -hmm. you look back, you said you opened your school in 2012. Mm -hmm. yep. right, so, so certainly long enough that you're doing some things differently than you had done them when you opened. What are some of those things that are different now versus the beginning of your martial arts school ownership? Yeah, yeah. well, one of the funny things is that um, I was just having a conversation with some of my, my higher ranks uh, at this testing. We do a lot more breaking in our school now than when we first started. And I mean a lot more. Like I would never hit a piece of concrete until 2013. And um, after 2013, I probably didn't hit another one until 2015. Um, and I had seven people break concrete at their testing and, and concrete's not required. It's uh, completely optional and they just wanted to hit concrete. And so, uh, you know, we throw the concrete down and they hit two, three pieces of concrete at a time, feet, hands. You know, I had one guy who did an ax kick on two pieces of concrete with each foot, did a four inch uh, board break with a downward palm strike, a two inch uh, ridge hand strike, and then a three inch uh, just a, from three inches away, did a palm strike from there with his left hand and in complete succession, one after the other. And it was like insane, insanely quick. I don't know that I could have, or let me rephrase, I don't know if I'm um, crazy enough to do it that fast. Um, and, and it was because he wanted to do that. And, you know, I just didn't train that way whenever I was coming up through the martial arts. And we didn't really train that way for the first four years that we were open and maybe even five years that we were open. And just in the last two years, since we implemented new breaking requirements for our belt testings, people have opened up and wanted to do a whole lot more than just a normal old board break. So um, that's one of the things I find exciting now, too. Mm -hmm. We've talked about a lot of different things today, different parts of your martial arts journey, your career, the things that, you know, it's clear that you're passionate about. But one of the things that I thought we were going to get into, and we, we kind of we got sidetracked, but in, in a great way, was, was movies and, and pop culture. You talked about the Power Rangers, and, and you talked about watching The Karate Kid when you were, when you were younger, you know, even though it came out before you were born, which is totally fine. But like that <laughs> might have been a little bit of a jab at me, and that's fine. That's fine. Uh, you know how many times, though, <laughs> I, 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 I will be talking about movies and martial arts movies, and then my adult class will be bringing them up, and I'll be like, hey, guys, I... Just want to remind you that that came out before I was born, and then to watch all of their faces just suddenly sink a right. little bit, right? Because yeah. we historically think of people who are teaching us things as being older than us. Exactly, that can, that can be hard to wrap your brain around. But if we look a little more modern, movies that came out, you know, after you learned how to walk and tie your own shoes, are there any that that really? resonate for you or, or or even stuff that's that's far more contemporary stuff that's come out in the last couple of years well um you know there there's really if i were to kind of boil down three movies um that have come out since uh really since i have been aware of martial arts um the first one is um and it's really not that great of a movie 
uh, but it's the Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Yeah. It was, that came out in, I think, like 92 or 93. Okay. It actually introduced me to who Bruce Lee was because I had no idea who Bruce Lee was until I watched that movie. Um, and then that opened up, you know, JKD and, and Wing Chun. And, and, you know, I actually trained in some of that in college. And that helps um, shape my uh, martial arts training through the years. Um, so that was that was one. And then um, the tricking that I saw in Romeo Must Die, a Jet Li movie, mm-hmm. which was like 98, 99. Um, and that came out about the same time as XMA or right right before XMA. Um, again, opened opened my eyes to to some of that uh, some of that, st- that stuff that I didn't train in. And uh, so I thought that was really neat. And then the last one has been one more recently, and it's 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 um, I think it's Undisputed Two. It's the one with Scott Atkins and uh, Michael J. White, and uh, mm. seeing somebody that's a little bit older still be able to do a lot of the jump spins and the the tricks and the five forties and throw some of that stuff made me realize that okay, if 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 I as long as I stay active, um, and really work at what I'm doing and train the proper way and have a good nutrition, then I should be able to do things, you know, much longer into life than, you know, early thirties, mid thirties. Cause I think he's now in his mid forties and, and still throwing insane tricks and, oh. and things of that nature. Sure. Are you, are you thinking of undisputed too? I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Cause I think the yeah. first, uh, first one he was not in and then he, you know, he, that launched his whole Boyka series. Right. I, I just did a quick Google search while we were talking, and that, of the of the four movies that that they've shared, well, one one is not out yet. Uh, that's the one yeah. that has the most notoriety. Yeah, yeah. I, I think martial arts movies. You know, it, we are in a a realm that does not do a great job of elevating people to the level of of broadly admirable. You know, it's it's very easy if you look at. I mean, we, we've we've talked about Master Townsend, who's an an amazing martial artist, an amazing breaker. But mm-hmm. people know him for breaking. So if someone isn't, if breaking doesn't jive for them, it's easy for them to look at him and say, eh, you know, that's cool, well, but that doesn't work for me, right? And and you can and you can say that about every single person, the the people that we think about as great martial artists from from the past generation. They tended to be known for, say, full contact kickboxing. Mm-hmm. But when we when we look at movies, that tends to be a little more universal for us. And 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 I don't want anyone to think I was I was intending any disrespect to Master Townsend. That's not that's not what it is. Because if you listen to the episode, you know I have the utmost respect for him and and his accomplishments both in and outside of breaking. You know, he's a phenomenal martial artist and and, and a good guy. Yeah, and and it's and it's funny you can see it even in the littlest of things too. Like, um, <clears throat> I've thrown a couple breaking pieces together on my YouTube channel, and they've only got like a few hundred views. Where most of the point fighting tips that I give have you know tens of thousands of views. Sure. And so like I'm kind of pigeonholed into the point fighting guy, um, where you know I was teaching people how to break concrete. <laughs> Right. And and so when we look at those movies, they tend to be a little more universal because those are people that we want to be, but we we will never be because by definition, they're actors playing a role that is larger than life. Yeah. And it would be nice if we could have some larger side of life, but still attainable role models. Maybe we'll get some of those soon. Hmm. Ones that we can kind of universally accept. Now, you mentioned your YouTube channel. So this might be a good place to tell people about what you've got going on and and how they can find it online. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, the, my my YouTube channel is kind of the thing that I uh, post to the most. I've <clears throat> had an injury back in July to my left big toe. I actually got it crushed under my own foot Ooh. on my mat, and uh, have quite a bit of pain on it. So I haven't really posted a lot to it uh, recently. But we're starting back up this week in recording. Um, and I, I post a lot of tips and uh, um, workouts and things like that for, uh, like I said, mainly for point fighting. There's some stuff in there for, for kicking for forms and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, like I said, some breaking stuff in there too. But try to give as many 
um, Taekwondo point sparring or, or even some of the, the karate point fighting, uh, sport karate stuff in there that I've learned throughout the years and, and things that I've used that have been really successful for me um, through my competition journey and, and, and all that fun stuff. And then I, I also post a lot of those things out to Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter and all the fun things as well. Mm. Nice. And of course, again, we're going to have links to all that. So if you're driving around the treadmill, you don't have to worry about jotting this down and risking personal injury when we <laughs> have that happen. Cool. Now, this, is, this has been awesome. I appreciate your time. Thank you so, so much. And of course, you know how we end. One more thing for the folks listening. What parting words of wisdom would you give to the people today? Um, yeah, my, my biggest thing is just to always push forward. Failure is going to happen, but that's when you learn the most. So no matter uh, where you're at in life, just push forward. One of the things that I enjoyed about today's conversation is that Mr. Brown is old enough to have achieved quite a few things. Training and rank and competitive success and having his own school. But he's young enough and started at an age where he sees, seems to have a great memory of everything that's happened. And that allows him to draw some connections, to connect some dots and share stories with us that allowed us to connect dots, not only in his story, but if you're anything like me, with mine. And so I appreciated that insight. And I got to be honest, I got some wheels turning now. And I love when I come out of an interview and I've got wheels turning. So, Mr. Brown, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciated it. And I look forward to talking to you soon. You can find the show notes with photos and links to the things that we talked about at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find everything else we do from all of our other content, links, you name it. There's just too much to mention at whistlekick.com. If you do make a purchase while you're over there, Use the code PODCAST15, saves you 15%, and it helps us know who's listening. You can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.